Uh, we ready? Yeah, I think so. It seems that uh, all who wanted to join us already joined us. So welcome everyone to our second talk of this term. Our today's guest is uh, Ben Ford, who received his archaeology degree from Reading University in 1990 and became a uh, active member of, of Oxford archaeology team since 1996 and where he serves currently as a senior project manager. Uh, as a senior project manager, he also led excavation project uh, at Westgate, uh, which was very big collaborative project uh, recognized as a best archaeological one uh, for year 2016. Uh, with enormous public engagement. Uh, currently, uh, he's working on uh, Previn Hall or like managing the, the whole project of Previn Hall, uh, as, which is excavation uh, that is as a part of new accommodation building for uh, Brazenose College. And it is a site spanning from Bronze Age uh, up until the 16th century, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, without any further ado, I'm leaving this uh, virtual and also physical stage for you now, Ben. Thank you, Jakob. So good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm going to basically talk to you about what I know of the site from the excavations that we've literally just finished. So there's no analysis that's been done so far. Not all the finds have been washed, not all the samples have been processed, no carbon dates are back. We have some spot dates from the pottery and um, we have our understanding of uh, the site sequence as we excavated it. And all I'm going to tell you about the site is based on, on there's somebody, um, sorry we have to let people in. Um, so um, all I'm going to tell you is based on what we excavated, but also on previous uh, evidence from the site um, when it was excavated in the mid 70s uh, by John Blair, who's a professor at Queen's in Oxford and who came to visit the site to see our excavations. So there, there, there's, a, there's um, a body of evidence already um, from previous excavations. It's a body of evidence from our excavations. There's also historic buildings and maps, et cetera, et cetera, that we can uh, borrow from to try and understand the sequence. Now, uh, the image on your screen shows um, top right corner, the green blob with the zigzag is Castle Mound, which is the Norman um, um, Castle Mound. If you go to the left top corner, that's the Westgate excavation that Jakob just mentioned, and bottom left, is the through and hall excavations underway with all of our mechanical diggers and all the props holding back the, the basement walls. So um, the archaeological work that we do at Oxford Archaeology it stems from um, central government planning policies. So um, we don't get to choose where we do. So we're not, we're not, if you like, I'm not a researcher in a particular field or a particular topic. I'm a, I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. Um, we will attach research aims to the work that we do, but the work that we do is in places and locations that are dictated by development. So it's already a skewed sample, if you like, in that way. Um, but my particular interest is working in towns because it's more complicated, more interesting, and I don't get bored. Um, in the UK, all developments have to be considered in terms of a number of things, and archaeology is one of them, and that's administered through the local planning authority um, at, um, for, based on a national uh, policy that relates to um, how people deal with archaeology all over the country. And that's been in place since 1990 uh, on the books, if you like. And that's led to a huge amount of extra archaeological uh, investigation in uh, the UK. And P 
people have been synthesizing that in the last 10 years or so, starting with Bradley, when he did the, the prehistoric Richard Bradley. So, and people have been synthesizing evidence um, from certain periods because there is just a huge amount of data. But in Oxford um, and other historic towns, concern came on the destruction of the uh, historic environment within our historic towns after the Second World War. Um, a lot of buildings were getting torn down, uh, new horrendous concrete buildings and dual carriageways and inner distribution roads were being built. And people who saw uh, um, medieval buildings and Roman walls being torn down to make way for this um, bright new world were concerned enough um, to start making the noise. And the first time that um, an archeologist wrote a document about um, how important it was to have a look at the archeology span in Oxford before it was destroyed was in 1967. And that's the document, um, City of Oxford Redevelopment Archaeological Implications. And that, if you like, um, is a precursor to this um, policy approach. Um, but it was all at the time, it was all done by amateurs. So it was all people who, a lot of people actually who were students at the university, who were archaeologists, were volunteers on these excavations in, in the 60s and the 70s. And in fact, a lot of students volunteered and, and did some of the excavation work on Foon Hall with John Blair in the mid 70s. And it was done in the summer and it was funded by local businesses and stuff like that. Now it's all funded by the developer, i.e. the polluter, if you like. And it's from the, the uh, European Union principle of the polluter pays. That's, that's the background. I will lean forward. Okay, so let's start as all good textbooks should by putting ourselves in our topographic and geological setting. That red star is where the site is that I'll be talking about. And the site is actually only about 150 yards from where we're sat um, in this uh, Dorfman um, building here in St. Peter's. And that's on the uh, western side of the southern end of a gravel promontory um, that is between the Cherwell to the east and the Thames to the west. And you can see that tongue of uh, gravel coming down from the north, very prominent and surrounded by floodplains. Here's a lidar of uh, that same floodplain. Uh, the red stars in the same place as the last plan, on the left, the Thames, and on the right, the Cherwell. And this really illustrates um, how prominent that north-south promontory is. And it's a classic crossing point for the Thames, where it narrows and gets uh, the floodplain narrows in this crossing points to the left of that red star, and to the right, to cross to the Cherwell as well. So if you were traveling up country from the prehistoric period, you would have crossed the Thames and the Cherwell at, at this point and followed a route up through the middle of that promontory. Even now, um, people will know um, who've been in Oxford long enough that even in the summer, that floodplain is still very much active. And in the winter, often on a seasonal basis, it's very hard to come in the Botley Road and the Abingdon Road. So the topography of where Oxford is re really still affects the town. Um, but of course, these floodplains were much more natural uh, and less controlled um, prior to the medieval period. So we've got this very, very distinctive promontory of land. Our site within the urban context on the left um, is in, well, it's right in the middle of modern Oxford, but it's in the um, northwest corner of historic Oxford. And just to make things more confusing, the early maps uh, put north at the bottom of the map. So that Agas map on the right there is 1588. Um, and it's um, puts north at the bottom. So it's this nice isometric view um, of the city. And if you look, I've extracted 
part that relates to us. You can see on the right hand side the edge of the castle coming round and the castle moat and the red rectangle is the site that we investigated. So we use map based evidence and the map based evidence uh, from the 16th century suggests that not a lot is going on on this site. If you scan through to the 17th century and Oxford has some really, really good um, town maps, obviously people loved planning Oxford um, and drawing these wonderful um, isometric views. But again, that red rectangle on the left, right in the middle of the image, is the gardens um, that the excavation was conducted in. And just to the bottom of that, uh, of that rectangle, the bottom left corner, there's a, there's a building with a shaded roof. And you can see that building is um, part of Fruin Hall. And there's a building parallel to the site, just to the north of that, which is the Fruin Hall building that's still on site. So we've got our historic, we know that the promontory is a place that people like to settle. We know that we've got um, a town that has medieval, if not Saxon, definitely Saxon origins. We know that any dig within that town is going to have potential to reveal Saxon and medieval remains. Um, from previous excavation works at the site done by um, John Blair um, with the help of volunteers, we have this plan of what St Mary's College uh, may well have looked like. And that is from a, a written documentary um, description of the site uh, prior to Brasenose College inheriting the site in the late 16th century, but also based on standing uh, evidence, so standing building evidence, and an examination of those components and putting them all together with the maps as well. So there is, we, we went to this site knowing that there is good potential for archaeology to be discovered. But potential isn't everything because some sites have already been dug away in the past, say by a modern basement. So you can have, dig anywhere in Oxford, you're gonna have potential to hit really good archeology. span If somebody's dug a hole there before, they're gonna have dug it away. So nothing beats going to the site and doing a few trenches beforehand. You'd be a fool not to. So back four years ago, we did these um, five, what we call evaluation trenches, which are sort of two by five, two and a half meters by five meters long. And they were targeted on these geophysic anomalies that we um, saw as well. And the whole area was just this really nice garden. It had a music room over to one side. It was really secluded. It was very private. Um, it had these mature trees and it was, you know, students sipping coffee and talking about their latest um, thoughts, etc. So it was like this proper idyllic place. We weren't allowed to disturb the trees, so these trenches had to be hand dug and carefully around the roots. And we were, so we were slightly constrained on where we could dig, but we were able to get these five trenches in. And based on these five trenches and what we found in them, we drew up this model of what we thought the site would look like. So you can see along the top, um, we've got each one of the trenches numbered, and then we've stylized the archaeology that we found in there and squeezed it into and phased it. And then we've, um, we've got the height in meters OD. So you can see at the bottom, you've got the natural gravel promontory that we talked about. Then above that, you've got the buried soil. And above that, you've got the Saxo-Norman horizon with a medieval garden soil above that and the Tudor horizon above that. So we have our model of what the stratigraphy, the broad stratigraphy on the site would look like. And we know that in the uh, Tudor horizon, we've got this series of very, very large pits that were excavated um, through the earlier sequence. So Tudor archaeology destroys earlier archaeology. Medieval archaeology destroys Saxon archaeology. Saxon archaeology destroys Bronze Age archaeology. So don't forget that as we're going through the story of the site. Every time you go back in time, there will be less archaeology, there will be potential archaeology that you can look at because there's more of the later archaeology that's destroyed it. So there's our model. 
This is what we went to the site with. Um, and this is the site. So the site is dictated by um, the basement that is part of the new development. So that big, horrible pink um, U shape is the shape of the basement for the new building. The strange purple uh, double lined um, shapes above are the pipe work that are gonna connect the uh, heat source pump and the pump bores are the little dots. And then the yellow uh, rectangles are the corners of the projected corners of what Blair thought was the outline of if we go back, it's the corner, right-hand side, bottom right corner of the, the court quad for St. Mary's College. So we've projected that onto, come on laptop. Hmm, doesn't want to, doesn't want to change slide. Okay, this, this might be, this might be a dangerous maneuver. Oh, hello. Oh, no. Everything's gone mad. Hold on. Sneak preview. <laughs> Tantalizing, eh? Um, okay, so we dug. Everything in the basement was going to get destroyed. So the level of the basement below all the archaeological secrets that we worked out, the level of um, the impact of the pipes that connect up all the heat source pump sit above, but we've got to keep an eye on it. All of the um, stuff is outside of where Blair projected St. Mary's College to be, and that's deliberate to try and not affect the archaeology of that. So that's preservation in situ of the St. Mary's and preservation by record of everything else in the basement, okay? So now we're just going to go up uh, through the archaeology of the site, and we're going to start um, with the natural gravel, talk about the prehistory, then the, then the Saxon, then the medieval, and then the Tudor, and then we'll come back into the present. So here's the basement, and that basement, um, the yellow, the light colour is the gravel of the site. So that is the natural gravel under the promontory of, of Oxford. And it's a very, very free draining gravel. It, um, it will not flood, it can rain as heavy as you like on that, and it will all drain away. So this is a perfect place to settle um, um, above the floodplain and to be settled above and occupy um, above the flood, floodplain. And on the right-hand side is a profile that we um, exposed. At the bottom is the natural untruncated gravel. Halfway through is the buried soil, which was still intact. And it was intact because it was buried below a Bronze Age burial mound. Now, this is a really unusual state of preservation. Bronze Age burial mounds are known in Oxford, um, in other places, and we'll talk about that in a second, but they've usually been ploughed out. Their mounds do not survive, let alone the mounds surviving inside the city as we are. So this is a very, very unusual situation. And as people may know, when you get a buried soil that's been preserved under an earthwork, you can do all sorts of environmental studies on that buried soil, right? Because it's been undisturbed. You can do OSL dating on that soil because it's been sealed from natural, natural light. You can take soil columns through it so you can see what that buried soil was like in terms of its environmental indicators because it's been preserved wholly underneath a prehistoric barrow mound. Here's the soil being excavated and it's obviously been disturbed in the Neolithic. So um, there were no Neolithic features on the site. Um, and the, but the soil had been disturbed. So we've got this serrated uh, blade and we've got this um, small scraper, crudely made scraper. Um, there are other Neolithic pieces of flint, but there wasn't distribution of flint working residue. It's not, it's not a working site. There was no camp there. Um, there's no evidence for farming or art marks, um, which we looked for. But 
we have got evidence for Neolithic activity. And what was Oxford's promontory like in the Neolithic period? Well, there's been a lot of work on that recently, and all of this evidence has come from commercial archaeology. Um, up underneath, underneath um, Kendrew Quad, up at Keeble College and uh, St John's College, um, just up by University Parks, about 10 years ago, massive ditch, top right, for um, a late Neolithic henge monument was found. This is one of the largest 20 henge monuments in the country. Uh, there's a reconstruction, simple watercolour, bottom right of that. And that monument sits at the centre, right in the centre of the promontory of Oxford, and um, then becomes a focus for a Bronze Age burial uh, complex. And that is the context in which our Bronze Age burial mount sits. Now, what you're looking at here is the, the Bronze Age burial mound and ditch, but there's an awful lot of other truncation that's affecting it. So what I said before about medieval features cutting the earlier. So in the foreground, for instance, there's a 14th century cellar that's cut all that ditch and mound away. But essentially what you're looking at there, if you see the light brown and reddish colored soils, that is the ditch and bank to the Bronze Age burial mound, probably beaker period. And these beaker mounds um, gather around this henge monument. So the henge monument makes it a ritual landscape. There's other Neolithic monuments as well, an earlier mortuary enclosure over on the um, um, Radcliffe um, infirmary site. These are all in just north of the city. Um, but there's other um, beaker mounds um, known underneath the city as well, but not with, not, with, not with the mounds, sorry, only ditches are found. On the left, top left there, you'll see that is the infill ditch. So it's about, it's a classic beaker ditch, it's about one and a half metres wide at the top, about 1.2 um, deep, a bit deeper, and maybe one metre wide at the bottom and a flat base. So classic beaker a uh, burial mound ditch, ring ditch, and you can see the mound material forming on top of the soils as it goes northwards. Usually these will have a central burial, so a beaker burial with um, an incubation with grave goods. We did not find the center, but in a later medieval pit, we did find the disarticulated remains of a human. Um, and we found it over the course of about three or four weeks of excavation. Bits kept turning up from different pits in the same area. We think that these bones belong to the original um, burial that belonged to this uh, Beaker Mound. Um, and, but we've got to do some carbon dating on it to prove that because they're redeposited, disturbed in later medieval contexts, later medieval pits have dug through it. Um, we use the um, Oxford Dating Service, so they do a, a commercial service for us um, and came out and took OSL samples from the buried soils. Um, you can see top left, there's a hole in the um, soils that are backfilling the uh, ditch around the mound there. We didn't find any pottery um, to date the ditch. There's very few finds to date this um, monument. And so we're gonna be reliant really on the form of the monument, uh, the, the human remains, and the OSL dates for our, for our um, stratigraphic dating, scientific dating. So just to um, illustrate how big that is, I haven't put a scale on this. Like I say, we've only just got off site, but the red outline is the outline of the basement. And the images that you've been seeing is in the right hand wing of that basement. But we also found, and before we found this little bit in the left hand wing that gave us the position of the burial mounds ditch, we thought it was the green circle um, with the mound hashed in. Um, but actually when we found the new part in the left hand wing, we were able to, to move the position of the mound into its true location. And we'll come back to this image when we talk about the Saxon period. So let's put that in context. 
So the Oxford Henge, uh, on either side of that left-hand image, you see the green floodplains. On the left, the Thames, and on the right, the Cherwell. The white is uh, the uh, gravel promontory, and there's the Oxford Henge. You can see how Parks Road actually comes down and avoids that Henge monument. So that Henge monument was extant in the medieval landscape, as were all of these uh, Beaker period burial mounds, um, except for the ones underneath the town itself, which would have got subsumed as soon as it became a Saxon burp. The uh, ones in the Ox Oxford Parks have been known about for quite a while because they appear as crop marks, top right. Um, and you can still see them on a, on a dry summer if you go up to um, parks. Um, and if you've got a drone, you can see them in all their glory. Fly the drone up. Um, just a nice little bit of psychogeography for you. The Sackler Library, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, the exact circumference of the Sackler Library sits exactly on a Bronze Age beaker burial mound that we found when we did the excavations there before they built the library. That is quite bizarre. Not only that, but the whole dig was overlooked by Professor Barry Cunliffe's office. So there's some weird archeological connections going on in Oxford. That's not a scientific judgment, that's just my observation. But that library, when you go into that library building, the scale and size of that library building is the same as the Bronze Age burial mound that ditch that was found on that site. And you can see the red star is our new burial mound that we found at Fruin Hall. Above it is the one at St. Michael's, which is on St. Michael Street, just to the north of here. And then the Beaumont Street ones, which is the ones uh, for the Sackler Library, is just to the north of that, with Oxford Parks much further to the north. And I'm sure excavations in the future are going to find more of these under the city. And there's a reconstruction of uh, the Oxford Parks and the Radcliffe Infirmary Quarter um, burial mounds situating and concentrating around the earlier Henge Monument. Now we've got to jump all the way forward because we had no Roman and no Iron Age evidence. In the Roman and Iron Age periods, the promontory becomes um, a bit of a backwater. Dorchester on Thames becomes the big civitas, um, and the promontory is farmed to a greater or lesser extent by small farmsteads. It's not really until we get into the Saxon period where the river becomes um, a main focus between um, warring factions different political factions and as you can see we're, we're at this junction between the large late Anglo-Saxon um, um, land holdings of Wessex, the Dane law and Mercia and this is the context that Oxford as a town develops in um, and, and around 900 either founded by the Mercians because we're on the north side of the bank of the river here or founded at some point by Alfred around 900. Um, it's difficult to know from archaeological evidence. It's not written down. Both, both uh, Mercia and Wessex could have founded a defended town on the boundary, and it's changing hands quite often. Let's take an 18th century plan. This is uh, Taylor's plan of Oxford, but I just like it as an image. Um, the blue rectangle is thought to be the original defended burr. So that is the original 10th century defended burr. The black stars, the one at the top, is the tower at Northgate, which is the top right image, still standing today, a late Saxon structure, as is the tower at the castle, which is a late, very late Saxon structure as well, built into the defences of the town. The yellow dashed lines are the extensions both to the east and to the west of the original burr. These have yet, the, the, the eastern extension is yet to be proven. That north-south dotted blue line has not been found, um, but there's a strange kink around Hartford College where New College Lane starts and the defences kink out. So um, 
it's thought that there's an eastern extension sometime in the in the 10th century and an extension to the west as well to take in what becomes the castle uh, the Norman castle um, until recently that north south line on the eastern side was also a dashed line but at the same time as the excavation was going on at the red uh, star we had an excavation going on for St Peter's College not another hundred meters directly north of where we're sat and we're actually sat over the late Saxon defences around Oxford at this point they turn um, from running east west to running north south at this very point that we're sat um, and our excavations um, further to the south um, found that ditch comprehensively found that ditch so I have now basically made that line solid and the pink curve is the curve of the um, later um, Norman um, Bailey ditch coming around the Norman castle so our red star we're firmly embedded in Anglo-Saxon Oxford we're in the defended town we're inside the defences. These are earthen ramparts, big ditches outside, fortified ramparts with walls in front of them, walls getting rebuilt, sometimes laced with timber, etc, etc. Um, this, this area is very much contested um, over a significant period of time. And this is the excavation at St Peter's College. This is a uh, much better use for the area than it was when it was the Conservative Club. Um, you can see the Conservative Club's been demolished. Praise the Lord. And um, if you look, it's a very difficult photo to focus on, but that far section at the back there, you can see tipping lines, tipping down. And those tipping lines are tipping late Anglo-Saxon deposits infilling the ditch. So at some point when the when the the fences expand, they start infilling the ditch to allow the expansion of the city in the late Anglo-Saxon period. What's that got to do with Fruin Hall, I hear you ask? Well, inside the defended town, there's settlement. And almost everywhere you dig inside Oxford, you, you will come across at least some really residual Anglo-Saxon material. Um, we were very fortunate on this site to come across sunken floored uh, building, not let's call it a semi cellared building. Um, the rectangle that you're looking at here with all the burning in it and the scorched um, earth is probably the burnt down remains of a, a, an Anglo-Saxon structure inside of which we found um, late Anglo-Saxon pottery, loom weights, etc, etc. It seems to have burnt down either deliberately or accidentally, it's hard to tell, because there are multiple fire points within it. Um, so it looks like the structure of the building has, its, has itself fallen inwards and been burnt. When you think about the different uh, things that are happening in Oxford as the boundaries moving, um, conflict between warring factions, um, it's nice to kind of dwell on the idea that perhaps this was some sort of raising to the ground of part of Oxford during one of those battles between Wessex and the Dane law, perhaps. Or perhaps this is just a ritual way in which Anglo-Saxon people destroyed their buildings. You might think um, about the interpretation comparing this to other cellared sites around Oxford, and equally you will see that there are significant burning events in these types of buildings so sometime in the um in the 10th century mid 10th century onwards probably late 10th century we're getting a lot of evidence for um these um semi cellared buildings um probably storage rooms below um first floor um rooms um being burnt down some of them have got huge stores of grain in them so there's a loom weight from late Anglo-Saxon. There's a bit of Anglo-Saxon pottery, not a huge amount. Um, in, in the bottom left picture there, right in the center, you see the very dark blobs. 
those are the different concentrations of burning within this cellar building. And on the right hand side, the interesting thing to observe here is that this cellar building was constructed exactly central and in the southern edge of the Bronze Age burial mound. Now, maybe it's a coincidence, maybe it isn't, but it is well known that um, Anglo-Saxon sites like to reuse and get some authority from Bronze Age sites. Anglo-Saxon burial uh, cemeteries will often tail off from Bronze, Bronze Age cemeteries. They will be cut into Bronze Age burial mounds and then tail off to the south and southeast. Here we have a probably a domestic structure cut into exactly that southern point of the burial mound. I don't know what it means, but there you go. The facts is the facts. So we have to spin on now and we come out of the Anglo-Saxon period um, and we enter the Norman period. So this is a really interesting site in the Norman period. It is a very large um, Mancio site, um, probably a very large Norman Lord's holding. Um, and the bottom left there, it shows the streets around the holding and the uh, gray area within that is the site that we excavated. Um, this is the work by John Blair. Not only has he deconstructed um, who owns the land um, in and around this in the 13th century from the hundred rolls, but he's also used um, some of the property deeds to trace back um, the owners of the site from when it was um, handed and sold over to St Mary's College for its founding in 1435, all the way back to um, the 12th century. Fruin Hall is one of the oldest used domestic buildings in Oxford still apart from the churches and it's used by the students um, it's it's a place to go and relax um, it's got a piano in it it's got seats and sofas in it you can go down there and relax drink beer play music etc um, but this um, vaulted basement was probably built between 1090 and 1150 um, and it's obviously seen some very, very interesting times on this site. It was part of this very large um, land holding. It was built exactly to the north of the Bronze Age burial mound, whose mound was still extant because we excavated it, so it must still have been influencing the landscape. So this, this, this um, big hall with this undercroft, this is an undercroft above a uh, first floor hall, big, big hall with a central fireplace, etc. stone built building, um, has survived up until this, um, up until now from 1090, 1100 odd. Um, and it's part of this very large Norman land home holding, but not a lot else was known about the site. We've got this large building that survives, but what else is on the site? So this is where the, the archaeology uh, really contributes to our understanding of, of what this big Mancio is, is like. We've got supply of water. So we're on a promontory. You've got to dig down through that promontory to get to your water source. And these, these wells are ingenious um, and it takes some effort to construct them. And then we found maybe three or four on the site from different periods. But this is the, uh, the 11th century, 12th century well that goes with the undercroft, the original phase. And you can see that how deep we had to dig to get to that, to find that well. Um, construction wise, there's a lot, of ex a, lot of, a lot of building work going on. Top right hand image, you see these kind of um, ringlets, if you like, within the pit fills. Um, these are it's probably slate lime for, for making mortar. So you're, you're um, heating um, limestone up in water and slaking it, and it will make a, a, a lime putty, which you're using then um, to um, construct your buildings as a mortar. 
And that pit is in the left-hand image, middle left below the big orange beam that's holding the sides of the trench up. Now we found a lot of these um, slate lime water pits um, in this um, south uh, west corner of the site. And so it looks like what we've got is a construction yard area, probably for the building works to build um, the large um, undercroft, the stone buildings that comprise the undercroft, et cetera. But um, down on that left-hand image, you can see other large pits being excavated with various things dumped in them. And that's um, the, the broken waste and the waste from the house, the use of the houses that will tell us about the, uh, the, the lives and material culture of those that are living on the site. So we've got a number of things that, that these finds are telling us. Top left is part of a unique ring lamp. These are based on Roman ring lamps, but this is a medieval version, and it would have had a number of wicks around the lamp and burnt in a number of uh, places, um, drawing on the oils from, from the tube ring that it's the, the, the wicks are in. There's gaming, game counters made out of um, Ansler. Uh, there's Ansler working going on on site. So there's some sort of domestic industrial um, working uh, activity going on. There's writing, there's the bottom right, it's the top of a steli, uh, a bone uh, implement for writing in wax tablets. And we've got getting evidence of um, buckles and other dress fittings as well to give us an idea of what, what clothing people are wearing. So this is giving us, and, it, and, and I, I, have to, I have to add, these are all photos from the site um, we, the, none of these have been studied yet, but these are all Norman period um, evidence for activity on this site. What is going on here, on a site which can afford a big undercroft like that um, um, with these people who can be traced back through the deeds and the records? So later on in the 13th and the 14th century, the site's evolving and uh, new buildings are being added. Now, quite often these big land holdings, people are trying to make money out of them. The site has uh, fronts on both uh, Newin Hall Street and St. Michael Street and Shoe Lane to the south. It looks like those uh, frontages are being developed, but we're in the back area of that. Not only are there buildings probably along those street frontages that are gaining uh, rents for uh, the owner of the land, but there's also buildings um, in the middle and we're going to look at some of those buildings building one building two and building three building one is a basement probably originally um, first built in the 13th century so this is a basement that's younger than the undercroft at Fruin Hall but hasn't survived as long and got filled in after Brazenos College took the site on in the 16th century so most of the infill of this um, was um, late mid 16th century and later, so post dissolution material. Um, you can see that some of the walls at the corners survive, so you can join up the dots there, and you can imagine a big stone wall, much like uh, around the undercroft that we're looking at. Um, previously, you've got floor decorated floor tiles, uh, you've got ceramic roof tiles. Um, that's uh, giving us some indication of what the floors and the roofs would look like in these structures as well. This is building two. This is right in the southeast corner of the site. It's quite hard to pick out and I've, I've got a pointer, I'm afraid, but top left, you'll see a thick um, wall made of stone. That is the springing arch for a relieving arch wall, which is the northern wall to building two set into the corner of building two is bottom right this key hole shaped oven uh, relieving arches are used as a device for building foundations in soft ground so what is these relieving arches in bottom left you can see i've drawn a line where these arches would have been uh, all the stones being robbed away to use elsewhere in oxford to build buildings but it's a way, it's much like a window, uh, the, the, the force from uh, the weight of the building above is dispersed around the window, so then you can fill the hole with glass. Similarly in foundations, if you've got a soft spot, you don't want your weight going into the soft spot, so you bring the weight down from the building around 
soft spots in the ground. And what this is showing us is that we've got earlier activity that a building is then being constructed on top of. So relieving arches. Um, keyhole other oven in the corner, classic place to have a bread oven. So we could be looking at the kitchen. Um, we are to the south of what we think is property boundary at this point. And this building might relate to, uh, to a division of this large holding that's orientated on Shoe Lane to the south. Another uh, building that had uh, a corner half, but not as well constructed, um, was building three. This adjoined um, to the western side of the basement um, that we looked at in the first image, building one, and it has a series of uh, half settings in the corner, a little bit more ragged and a little bit more um, um, less well formed, but um, nonetheless, probably a kitchen. And you can see uh, the phase of uh, floor, uh, half floor on the left here is being removed to reveal an earlier phase where a cooking vessel has actually been left in situ in the hearth, almost as a like an offering, if you like, at the end of that hearth when the new hearth has been constructed on top of it. So there's these little indications of kind of almost like a almost I don't you know suspicious suspicions, ritualistic type behaviours that people have in their everyday lives um, that you're getting an inkling from. The, the, the Saxon uh, building located at the south extent of the mound, a little pot uh, left on the hearth when a new hearth floor is built on top of it. And these are actions of individuals who are making these decisions. Um, and they're, they're speaking to like how people think of the world. And of course, um, one, of the, one of the great inventions, not only do you have to have a well, to get your water, but you have to have a cesspit to um, dispose of your waste. And this is one of the best um, preserved cesspits, um, stone line cesspit that I've excavated in Oxford. Serious quantity of waste uh, has been designed to be um, deposited in this, this cesspit. So it suggests that there's a lot of people on this site. So all we've got a lot of buildings, we've got a lot of activity, and we've got a large cesspit. So there's a lot, there's, there seems to be a lot of activity and a lot of people buzzing around on this site. So it's not just this posh uh, uh, stone built Norman Lord's house. There's things going on. There's um, activity going on. One of the great things about these cesspits is we've taken a whole bunch of samples. And if we're lucky, we're going to get to find out about sorts of things to do with diet gut health, things like that, because hopefully there'll be mineralized remains um, and uh, carbonized remains as well. Um, just some of the finds um, off, off, the, off the, you know, from photographs from the site, um, there's a lot of consumption of liquids, probably beer, probably not that strong beer, but these ballista drugs at the bottom, I call it the first evidence for a Rastafarian culture in medieval Oxford, the red, the gold, and the green. I don't know, it's just nice colors. Um, huge amount of these jugs, serving jugs, serving at tables. So there's a lot of entertaining going on on this site. There's a lot of people sitting down and drinking. These, these are just a small um, proportion of what we found. I mean, talk about volume of animal bone material as well. There's a lot of animal animals being um, eaten at these tables that these that these jugs are sitting on holding the beer. But also there's um, a spindle world, top left, sp spinning for spinning wool yarn. Bottom right, we've got copper alloy plates, large piece of copper alloy plate, maybe even part of armor, who knows? Um, in the middle picture, we've got a decorated piece of copper alloy, could be a, a fitting off of a wooden chest, for example, and wooden chests are very important because you need to lock things away on sites like this. This is not everybody's got a stone building, so this, there's wealth on this site, 
and uh, keys such as the top one at the top uh, um, will, will come into use with an increase in prevalence of personal security. People are putting their stuff in chests and locking them up, personal security. So we've come out, these are all a bit cut and, and, uh, and thrust of this. We've gone quickly out of the Saxon period into the medieval period and just as quickly we're going to come into the later medieval period where the site is actually then granted by its last medieval owner um, to the Cistercian monks to build St Mary's College. Now there was a lot of fuss in the media about us finding the Lost College. I have to say we only found the one wall of the Lost College. Okay, so those buildings that we just looked at probably survived after the site was sold for the foundation of St Mary's College, um, but didn't survive the big rebuilding by Wolsey in about 1518. So from about 1435 till 1518, these, these uh, earlier medieval buildings were probably being used by uh, the college itself, they were reusing older buildings on site, but um, there's a lot of documentary record of um, the Cistercians who, of Osney Abbey who were grant, given money, granted money for the construction of this uh, college um, to um, they were being told off for not spending the money, not pulling their finger out. What's happening with the site? This goes on and on and on for about 80 years until Cardinal Wolsey says, if you don't sort this out, I'm going to disband your order. And they say, OK, well, yeah, that's a bit of a threat. And they'll probably do it as well. Of course, they later on, the solution happens to everybody. But in this short intervening period, about 1518, Wolsey stimulates the Cistercians to get on and build their college in town, finally. And this is the context in which our wall is found. And this is the context and the, the, the structure that um, Blair is talking about when he has um, done his reconstruction. So we know that a church is built. We know that another range is built. We know that through in Hall, the basement is already on the site because it's, it's there, it was built in, the 11th century, so it becomes part of the site. There's a description of, of, of a range of buildings and then um, what's called the South Chamber. So, and it's built on a, a, a cloistral form with a gatehouse and the gatehouse still survives. You can walk out St. Peter's tonight and you can go and see the gatehouse, um, what's left of it. Through, through the construction, I actually know they got hoarding up over it to protect it, but I've got a photo I can show you. So um, Blair did this reconstruction from a small number of trenches. Our trench only adds to the position of the southern wall, so the southern wall of the South Cloister. Um, there's the gateway. So this is our photogrammatic record of uh, the gateway in and there's the gateway um, um, blind arches as drawn by Blair below and there's the gates as um, you would enter it from New Inn Hall Street. So these are uh, uh, 15th century survivals, uh, maybe early 16th century survivals of the gatehouse into St Mary's College. And this is the wall that we found. And what's significant about this is the size of it. It's, it's, this, I've excavated a lot of medieval walls in Oxford, and this wall is 1.3 to 1.4 metres wide at foundation. It's huge. And some of the stones are as big as the table I'm sat at in this. Somebody with some serious money is, is, is paying for these foundations to be constructed, and some seriously decent building is going on top of it. And this, this speaks of this uh, patronage from Wolsey to get this built. And that's the only bit of the college that we found of that phase of the college. But it does help with this reconstruction because now on the right-hand side, the blue line that you see is where we found the wall. 
the pink lines of, is where um, Blair thought the cloister was. So if there's then another dig somewhere else, another bit's found, another bit's found over the years, then this can all be pieced together to reconstruct where St. Mary's is. But that hasn't stopped the college commissioning an artist to paint a picture of what it must have looked like, obviously. Um, not bad. You can see that the arches have been based on these arches here, uh, the top image on the right from the gatehouse. When we come back, see the arches on the left, exactly the same shape. That's four centered arch, the Tudor period, cloistral um, 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 appearance. And there in the, in the center at the back is the gatehouse with the um, gate leading into the cloistral wall. Of course, it may or may not have looked like this. And I'm not going to show you the view that he did from the church tower um, from uh, out in the street, because that church wasn't actually there at the time. It's a Victorian build. So what happened to St. Mary? So we all know what happened to Cardinal Wolsey, right? Um, Henry VIII um, was going through wives like he went through legs of lamb probably, and he wanted a divorce and Wolsey just couldn't get the Pope to agree. So Henry said, right, that's it. I'm going to create the Church of England and then I'll create my own divorce. Well, my own divorce, it'll be absolutely fine. And then Wolsey falls out of favour so that the man who's been basically getting Henry everything he wanted um, and putting England on the, on the European stage again, uh, is falls ill and dies on his way to London being summoned by Henry. So probably he was going to have his head cut off, but he falls in, ill in the carriage and dies. What happens to St Mary's College? Well, like with all of these things, the crown takes ownership of everything. The crown takes ownership of all of these monastic lands, the buildings, the lead on the roofs, the glass in the in the windows, the land itself. And then Henry buys favor with all of his noblemen by giving it all away. And then the noblemen make loads of money by basically trashing the buildings, taking the lead, selling the lead, selling the stone and repurposing everything. Because nobody wants, nobody wants monastic sites anymore, you know, because it's not, it's not happening. So, St. Mary's basically falls into disrepair. And by the 1530s, uh, by the 1580s, when we see Agassiz's map, there's nothing left of it, even though we know it was there because we've dug holes in the ground and found the foundations. So this is pulled down quite quickly. Um, and some of the stone must have remained on site because these are 17th century walls. Um, at the top is a wall that was revealed during the excavation you can see the Ashlar stone block stonework. That's probably from, from, from Wolsey's phase of rebuilding St. Mary's. And these cottages, when you go into um, Fruin Hall, um, you, there's a little lane that leads off New in Hall Street. And these are the 17th century cottages on the left-hand side of that lane. And again, you can see the use of these large Ashlar blocks. So these Ashlar blocks probably come from St. Mary's College. So there is a um, lot of reuse going on, a lot of rebuilding. Um, there's been a huge amount of archaeology going on in Oxford. This is just one of a number of digs. I mean, I'm working on um, maybe 15 different projects at the moment um, in different states of either planning or writing up. Um, there's literally been hundreds of excavations in Oxford. And recently there's been a whole suite of publications about stuff. Oxoniensia is the local journal. We ourselves, Oxford Archaeology, will publish our own research. And this was Oxford before the university, which was a, a synthesis that we put out about 12 years ago. The um, archaeologists from the city council put out the archaeology of, of Oxford in 20 digs, which is a great way into like what different evidence is being found in Oxford. And uh, the historical map of Oxford uh, came out before the Atlas came out. The Atlas came out this year, and this is a, a huge, um, glorious um, piece of um, historical um, bookwork on 
um, maps of Oxford and trying to um, put them all in the context of modern modern maps. So the thing we've got to remember is our work is only granted to us by the local planning authority because of national policy. Um, every now and again, that national policy is threatened. So um, it's great that we can do this archaeology here. Not every country um, does this amount of work um, when the environment changes and when building use changes. Um, and th this just gives you some idea of the type of evidence that you can get. And it's the addition of all the little excavations and how they all join up that help you understand um, how a town or how an area evolves. And that happens over time. And so it needs a lot of archaeological work and joining up the dots. Um, so long may it continue. And that's the end of the talk. You come over here, Jacob. We're taking questions. Yeah. Okay. So Jacob um, is opening up for questions. If anybody's got any questions, send them in. Yeah, so um, at the moment we're thinking uh, about 950 to 975 um, for the Saxon cellar building, but we have basically a lot more work to do. You saw how much charcoal there was, so we can get carbon dates, but they're quite broad ranged. We've got a good sequence uh, above and below, so we can maybe narrow the dating range down more narrow than uh, the pottery can give us as well, um, using carbon and Bayesian statistics. But I'm, I'm not hopeful. There wasn't like a lot of intercutting Saxon features. This was a, a building that maybe stood for, who you knows, 10, 20, 30 years, and then burnt down. Um, it wasn't, there wasn't another building put on top of it. So it could be right at the end of the, Saxon period, right before the Norman invasion. Um, that might explain why there's no new building built on top. Um, it was the only, I, th I think it was the only Saxon building that we found on the site. But if there are evidence, small pieces of evidence from other Saxon buildings, we could look at dating those as well and then try and piece it together. Um, that's, that's analysis that we've got to do coming up. So, yeah, I would say about nine, I would say 9.50 to 10.50 is what I'm going to say. Sure. Sure. So um, the, the, the question was, um, are there any activity areas or occupation evidence associated with the Bronze Age burial mound? And uh, the, the answer is no, because one of the interesting things about the site was the mound survived because it was a mound. Um, uh, the pits and the cellars and all the all the other activity that happened in the Medi Saxon medieval uh, and Tudor periods literally removed all the other evidence um, for that for that horizon of archaeology. There was no survival. There was maybe uh, an area about five square meters, ten square meters of of gravel that survived in other parts of the site. But the, the mound itself created, created its own survival, if you like. So there may well have been other uh, Bronze Age activity, like occupation activity nearby, 
some sort of activity. We won't know it's, it was all dug away by later evidence. So, but the mound itself is interesting how it how it how it's how it probably affected the local topography of of the site of the use in the Saxon period, and then potentially the position of Fruin Hall itself, which is a building that still survives today. So that internal topography to that site is influenced by a, something that was constructed 3,000 years ago. Yes. You mentioned that uh, the city can refer to Wessex and Bangor. Are really complementary evidence of how often the city can be transported? There probably is, but I'm the wrong person to ask. Um, the question was is there any documentary evidence? Um, so uh, for Oxford changing hands or battles relating to Oxford during uh, the Dane law period um, and the Viking incursions. Um, there's, there's plenty of evidence for battles in the Anglo-Saxon chronicles in and around. And of course, um, some of those battlegrounds will be known. There's the uh, St. Bryce's Day Massacre, which uh, specifically mentions around uh, I think it's 1005, 1006 AD, something like that, specifically mentions that uh, cockles in the corn. So the Vikings are called cockles in the corn and the king sends out a message that all the Vikings that are living amongst the Anglo-Saxons, living peace peaceably, should be extracted and killed, got rid of, purged. And nobody knew whether that actually happened or not. And then, interestingly enough, another Anglo-Saxon Viking prehistoric link up is that a mass grave was found in the upper fields of the Henge Ditch. They were dated, turns out, and an isotope work was done, turns out they were Scandinavian and they had axe wounds like they'd been chased. So they had wounds in the back of the leg. They had multiple chops to the head like somebody was angry, you know, like trying to destroy them, not a soldier trying to kill them, but somebody trying to basically destroy them. And then they were thrown into the ditch of the Henge Monument, which was extant at the time because the roads come round it into Oxford. And left there. So this is a so that is that that monument then becomes like a boundary, like a like a boundary um, before the town, if you like. So and and it's suggested that you know you try and should maybe you shouldn't link up historical event with archaeological finds. You've got to be really careful because of course, you know, there, there could be something undocumented that led to that easily. You know, a big is that a big scrap? A big scrap, you know, or 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 you, your archaeology finds things all the time that hasn't got a documentary reference to it. So why attach? You've got to be really careful as an archaeologist who's looking at the historic period to to attach um, documentary evidence to your your site evidence. But the isotopes says they from from northern climes. Uh, the dating work, Bayesian and carbon-14 work, puts it at about the right time. The wounds on them suggest that they were from the massacre, but they could be from something else. But that's interesting. There's another Saxon use of a prehistoric monument, late Saxon use. But it's, in a way, it's less seems less deferential than putting your house centrally that seems kind of to respect it thrown away dead vikings in a in a silted up ditch to a prehistoric monument uh, is, maybe that is it maybe that is an offering maybe there is a certain respect there difficult difficult to know um, do you have any idea of the uh, yes, so um, um, for those of you like prehistoric, 
um, the Oxford flood scheme is um, going to be constructed along uh, the, the western side of Oxford, right in the floodplain. And um, I did the evaluation there. That's going to start maybe next year or the year after. That's a huge channel that's basically going right through the Thames floodplain and looking at that prehistoric landscape and also Iron Age settlement, because there's Iron Age settlement on islands in, in the Thames floodplain. Um, so keep your, keep your eyes out for that. Um, there's various colleges. Colleges are always building. Colleges are always building because, you know, um, they've made their students suffer with really bad kitchens and really bad libraries for long enough. So <laughs> they found the money and a lot of them are redoing their libraries, rebuilding their kitchens, um, building new student accommodation. I mean, we're sat in the Dolphin Centre here, which is, was built about six, seven years ago. Um, interestingly enough, by the same architect who's building the building at Fruin um, that we just did the site for. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and Oxford's only going only gonna to grow and grow. Oxford, Cambridge, that whole link up, Oxford, Cambridge, is going to grow and grow. Um, over the years, so there'll be a lot of a lot of work coming up, and within Oxford, there's certain pressure because the archaeological resource is finite by its very nature. It's finite, so the more people and in Oxford, the the, the skyline's protected because it's the dreaming spires. So everybody builds a basement. So if you build a basement, you then destroy the archaeology. So the archaeology is getting destroyed to preserve the skyline. So now there's like, a, um, it's much more difficult to build a basement in Oxford. We worked on the last project where um, it became quite a difficult situation in that you, you you know, this finite resource is going to disappear. At what point do we then stop granting basement applications? I mean, in London, apparently there is literally, you know, very Rome within the Roman London, medieval Roman London, there's literally hardly any archaeology left because it's all been basement. So is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? Who knows? As long as, as long as it's recorded, as long as I get a job digging it up, I'm happy. Yeah, OK, the question was, um, how can the public or students get involved with work that Oxford Archaeology does? Um, so, um, or very rarely, um, we like with the Westgate, we ran a pop up museum. And we ran that for two, three months, and that was staffed entirely by members of the public. Um, that's incredibly rare to, to get a developer to fund that level of um, public engagement. Um, so, kind of excavation wise, we sometimes run training excavations um, but on our commercial work it's very difficult to involve people who aren't basically our employees because it, there's insurances there's we have to have these cards that says that we understand the health and safety risks and we've done these courses and da, 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 da. so it's very very difficult to get the public or students engaged on our work. Now, th that every now and again, and some of our office in the East is particularly good at this, um, we get sites where the developer says, yeah, okay, you can have this bit over here, this can be the voluntary dig area. And we have a voluntary dig on that bit. We were running a project a research project in Dorchester on Thames in the, where we were digging up the allotments um, to find the Roman uh, remains. And that was in conjunction with the university archeology span department. 
Um, these things come along, but it's, it's not as structured as you would hope. It's every now and again. Um, it might be more in our Cambridge office or one year there might be a project in our Lancaster office that, and that might be a public project related to something in that region. Um, in terms of field work, we did used to take undergraduates at Oxford on that training gig that we were doing at Dorchester on Thames and you were trained by staff from our supervisors from our company. That stopped about five years ago, maybe a bit more, and hasn't restarted again. So I don't know if anybody's going to get a training piece of training work back up and running that, you know, students can be invited to and engage in. I'm not sure. Sorry, probably not the answer you want. Probably you wanted me to say yes. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I would look at um, opportunities. Um, there's field schools around the place. I know. I don't know if Oxford itself. I don't know if the department's got got a dig on this summer. Does it? Oh right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, the onus is on on the students to find their own uh, field work to do. So, I mean, when I was young, go abroad, dig abroad. It's great. Go go to, go to Central America, and dig up some Mayans. That's what I would do. Um, if we don't have any other questions, then. Uh, Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, Ben. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, we would like to invite now anyone who wants to or has the possibility to come uh, to King's Arms Pub, where we will, are holding a social uh, historical society. And you as well, Ben, if you- I'll come for a pint, yeah, yeah. And hopefully uh, we will see the rest of you next week during our uh, next talk. So, goodbye until then. Right. Oh, is there a question or something? Oh, come to SOAG, South Fox Archaeological Group, all volunteers, all keen. So your, your chat there is I should have mentioned the local societies. That's quite bad of me, actually, because I go and talk to them. Yeah, yeah. We, we will ask about it. Yeah, yeah. Things are. Right. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.